Hello everyone, Top Hat Waffle here just to welcome you back to the next iteration of making our own Counter-Strike Global Offensive competitive level. Today we're going to be taking a detailed look at drafting our first Counter-Strike Global Offensive level and some level design tactics that most people will use when drafting out their level. Before we put the pen to the paper and we start drawing out our own layout, let's take a look at some existing levels that already work pretty well. We're going to start with the simplest level that everyone knows. We're going to start with Dust 2. The three things that I want to start looking at is the perspective of the map, you know, where we can go from the terrorist viewpoint or the attacking team. Next, we should look at where the defending team or the counter terrorist can go. And then lastly, we want to look at the collision points where the two teams will meet and have their engagements. Focusing on just the attacker's path, we notice that we have what forms almost a choice tree. We have three choices right at the beginning in Dust 2. That's we can go tunnels, long, suicide, and then from there we reach even more branching paths. We can go out to be site to a collision point, or we can go to lower tunnels. From lower tunnels, we're once again presented with another choice to middle, or we can loop back around to catwalk. Long A is a little bit different and does not have the standard branching paths that the rest of the level has. Looking at the counter terrorist side or the defender's side, we'll notice one thing. There's a lot less of it than there is of the terrorist side. This is because the counter terrorist team essentially owns that portion of the map at the beginning of the round. They are given a defender's advantage because in most situations, especially in Dust 2, it will be a 2 versus 4 or 5 at the collision point. Giving the defender's advantage allows for the players to take cover and call out for help if they need to. Lastly, there are the collision points. There are four prominent collision points that most encounters happen at at the beginning of the game. There's upper tons, middle, short and catwalk, and then long. As a round typically progresses, we've pushed past the initial collision point. This means that either the defending team has held that point and now has the opportunity to either move forward, or the attackers have broken the defenses at that collision point and have earned a push towards the objective. This is just one of the most basic ways that we can take a look at Dust 2's pathing. If we take a look at Mirage, we'll see a very similar story. We have a branching choice of paths for the attacking team, along with a smaller, shorter amount of paths for the defending team. There are also three collision points that are typically encountered in Mirage. And finally, we can take a look at Cache. Cache, just like the other two levels, has a choice path for the terrorist team. The counter-terrorist area is very much just like the other two levels as well. Cache has three main collision points where most encounters will happen. There's one more common way to dissect the CSGO level. This is either referred to as the four square clover or just the four box method. Take, for instance, the three levels that we just looked at, Dust 2, Mirage, and Cache. Each one of these levels follows this four box setup. We typically have two boxes for the CT side and two boxes for the terrorist side. You'll notice that the lines of where the boxes meet are approximately where the connectors in the level are. Essentially, all CSGO levels are laid out like this, except at the points where the overlap is and the height levels that they meet at. If we look at the pathing choices that we saw earlier underneath these boxes, we'll notice a correlation. Each team has two boxes that they stay inside until they meet the edge of a box, which is roughly also at a collision point. Setting up your layout like this is a pretty good indication that the level will work for Counter-Strike Go. Now the last thing that we should go over is timings. Let's pull back and look at the timings for just us two. The main timings that we're going to take a look at are the main path options from both spawns for both teams. The easiest way to find the timings for any level is to just hop into a single player game without any bots, spawn in a fairly neutral spawn point, pull out your knife, and then run to the destination that you want to find the timings for. For right now, let's just look at a few timings that I've previously collected so we can compare the attacking and defending team's timings. Starting with B site, we can see that the counter terrorist will reach a typical playable position in about 8 seconds. The terrorists reach the collision point, which is located through the tunnels, in about 13 seconds. 
This means that the counter-terrorist players have about two seconds before they may hear or see a terrorist. Of course, there's the variable of terrorist spawn points that may come into play, such as a bee spawn. Not all levels utilize fully random spawns, so that's a good way to mix things up. In Dust 2, there isn't as much random variance towards A long for the spawns as there is towards B site. This leads to a more cut and dry experience most of the time, with terrorists arriving at the door in about 10 seconds, and counter terrorists get to the corner where they will usually snipe and hold from in about 8 seconds. The middle of Dust 2 is one of the most distinct, well known, and iconic features of the map. With terrorists being able to see middle and counter terrorists cross pretty much instantly, counter terrorists take about 4 seconds to be able to get to mid to see the other team. If the attacking team full on rushes catwalk, they arrive at the stair choke point first. This is because of the player holding mid is typically supposed to watch this, and this provides another layer of strategy into the design of the level. This brings us to the second layer of timings. This is the rotations from site to site. After the bomb has been planted, players will need to rotate to attempt to retake the site. This is where rotate timings are very important. We'll notice that most timings and levels are somewhere between 10 and about 22 seconds. These are fairly standard rotate times, but it does not mean that you're locked into these times. Looking specifically at two A site to B site rotates, we can get from A to B using CT spawn in about 12 seconds. This is in contrast to using tunnels through catwalk in about 20 seconds. B site to A site rotations are fairly similar, where if we go through CT spawn, it takes us about 15 seconds, going through mid to Xbox and then up cat will take us about 20 seconds. There is about a 3 second difference here compared from going A to B because when we go B to A, we usually have to wrap around up ramp and into sight. This is where the height of a level can add an interesting dynamic allowing a team to rotate quicker to one site but not to the other. It's a good idea before you draft your level to kind of work out what a good area of timings are for your level. Sample some current levels that are already out in operations and in the competitive pool to get an idea of what currently works. A few other good things that you might want to keep just in the back of your head while you're building your level is who reaches my choke points first. What are the timings to there? How many choke points do I have and where are they going to be? Do my choke points allow for players to play with different styles? Is there close range? Is there long range? Is there enough to make the level fun for everyone? Do my choke points reward strategy, such as the use of utility grenades and the like? Are my choke points balanced? Does one team objectively have too many cover spots? Does one team not have enough? How many main routes do I have for each side? Does one side have an objective advantage over mobility because they have more or less pathing? Now that we understand this low level, very basic CSGO map design, where do we go from here? I like to start by getting a few concept images so I have the idea of my aesthetic in the back of my mind while I'm building my layout. This makes it much easier to implement the aesthetic later on after my layout is complete. You can use pretty much any form of drawing to draft your layout. I myself prefer Photoshop. You can use pen, paper, carrots, stick in the mud, it doesn't really matter. So with that said, I'm just going to start by pretty much arbitrarily placing a CT and a T spawn. From there I'll draw the three main paths that I want this level to have. While I'm drawing these first lines, I want to do it from the perspective of the attacking team. And then after that, I'll add some other connecting paths as well. Now, what works for me may not work for you, and these are just some general guidelines that you can use to kind of draft out your pathing flow. As you work more with the tools, you may find something that works better for you along the way. So once you learn what works for you, just go ahead and adopt that into your design style. During this first pass on the pathing layout, I'm really only thinking in the perspective of top down. Just one level, I'm not adding any height variance yet. After I've decided to mark down my collision points, which I'm doing here just in red color, I choose that I want to add some height information into this layout. This will help me just fully form the idea of the paths in my head that will make it easier for me to draw the paths around it in a little bit. 
don't be afraid to destroy part of this and reflow it. I wasn't happy with the terrace side of the map, so I just went ahead and redrew it. This is why we're here, we're concepting it out. The first draft is always terrible. One of the advantages of drawing your layout for the first time in digital software is that you can use layers, if your software supports it, to help preserve information as you build. We want to try to destroy as little as possible in case we want to revert back some of our changes. So I'm going to start by copying my path layout to a new layer. I'll end up renaming a few layers just for organizational purposes. Then with a copy created and stored to the side, I'm going to lower the opacity of my pathing layout so I can draw an outline on top of it. Now all we have to work off of right now are the paths that we drew. What I want to build now, I want to build out the actual halls and rooms around these paths. So I'll use a low size brush and just kind of start imagining what I want these to look like. This is where the concept art can really help make the level take its shape. So I know that the path at the top is going to be a rail track in an underground metro. So I'm kind of building that out while I'm drawing. This is one of the advantages of having concept images before you even start. It allows you to truly build out the area in your mind and then put it onto paper. Throughout this process, you're going to see that my hands aren't steady. My handwriting isn't neat. It doesn't really need to make sense to everyone. You truly just need to understand it yourself and be able to translate it into the software later for playtesting. While I'm doing this, I'm not 100% concerned with following my path layout. It's important that we have that so we understand the base layout. But while you're drawing the rooms and halls, you'll get ideas as you go. And this will make you want to change paths or add connectors while you're building. You don't want to be too concerned with scale at this point. Once we get it into game, we'll notice that some things are too big or too small and we'll compensate for that later. This entire process shouldn't take you too long. This took me about 45 minutes to get through the base layout and then the draw-in on top. Remember what we're doing here is 100% concept. It's not final. It's going to change. The first time you actually test this, it will be bad. Expecting perfection on the first go will never happen. Now that I'm done with the halls, rooms, and all the walls, I'll just fill in the center so I know what areas cannot be navigated by the players. Since I know what areas in my level will have height variation to them, I'll also mark that down with the shading like I did earlier on. Once all that's done, I'll probably add some notes to the layout just to remind me of what some areas are if I come back and I'm like, oh, what was that? I'll have a little note just to remind me what it is. With that, our rough draft of the first layout is complete at this point, and we're pretty much ready to get it into game as a top-down layout and run around and play test it. I hope you enjoyed seeing the process of drafting out your own pathway layout and then putting walls and everything else on top of it. Join us tomorrow when we actually block this level out and run around in it in game.